Ja, hej. Hej och tack. Nu börjar jag prata svenska. Yes, I, mean, I don't know why I start speaking in Swedish. <laughs> because I'm back in Stockholm. Um, where I used to live. In this very neighborhood where we are actually sending this transmission from. So, welcome back to all of you. I hope you are refreshed and uh, had your coffee. I certainly did. Mm. We uh, <laughs> had a quick breath of air also here. Um, and maybe we could take a quick look at the menti, the, the mood cloud that we created. Uh, do we have an impression, Johanna? We do, and it's looking very nice, I would say. It seems that a majority of you think that it's been very informative so far and interesting. And also we see puzzled and good popping up a bit. And confused. We and managed confused. to confuse some people. Yes. That's good. Indeed. Um, but yeah, we hope that we can remain informative and also, yeah, let's see what this cloud looks like by the end of the day. Uh, now we have a lineup of speakers from, uh, not from all Nordic countries, but at least from, from throughout the Nordic countries, from Iceland, from Norway and uh, from Sweden. But to begin with, we have a kind of a Nordic representative in this context, uh, Harry Flam. Uh, Harry, uh, are you ready to talk to us? Harry is the editor of the Nordic Economic Policy Review, which is produced by Nordregio but, uh, and uh, published by the Nordic Council of Ministers. Um, and it comes out uh, every year with a new topic and uh, this year, the next year actually, it will be focusing on housing. So it's, it's very apt. Um, so we are looking forward to seeing Harry. Seeing in Harry. No Harry. There is still no Harry. Yeah. So uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about the Nordic Economic Policy Review, Johanna. Ooh, you caught me a bit off guard there. Um, yes, Harry is the editor since this year. And as you just said, the next topic will be on housing. There was a peer review uh, seminar a month ago where the five different articles were presented by the authors and very interesting. And we're really looking forward to to the issue being launched early mm. or yeah, early next spring, I would say. So is Harry with us now? Uh, yes, I think uh, we might change the order of events here. Uh, so, the next person uh, attending will be from Norway, and we have a jingle coming up. Yes, so joining us now, hopefully, from Norway, is uh, Tina Sinclair. Tina, are you there? Yes. Hello. Hello there. Sorry to rush you into this. Uh, we, we lost a participant along the way. <laughs> but uh, glad right. to see you can join us here. So you are are our first and only participant from Norway. So maybe you could start out by saying a little bit uh, about what characterizes the Norwegian housing market, also in light of our discussion so far. Mm. Well, uh, as it's already surfaced, the Norwegian housing market is uh, highly privatized and is in some ways the odd one out maybe in the, in the Nordic context. Uh, Eight out of ten uh, Norwegian people own their own houses, even amongst the very young age group. Uh, and it's a very deeply historical and culturally founded uh, practice. It's almost so strong that it's uh, stigmatizing not to own your own home by the, by the time you're 30 years. And there is a strong ownership policy supporting it, uh, going back to the interwar years. Uh, home ownership is subsidized with tax reliefs on interest, uh, low property taxes, and and various institutions like the uh, Housing Loan Bank. 
so really ownership is encouraged and is uh, a lot cheaper in the long run uh, than uh, rental housing, uh, if you can get into the market, that is. Can you, sorry Hello? to interrupt, but uh, it's very hard to hear you. Can you maybe speak a little louder? Yes. Uh, I hope the Can technicians here, sometimes we have a problem with the sounds here from the studio also. So, so I think we hear you better now. Good. Well, there is a concern, even though the ownership uh, line is still very strong and has uh, broad political support in Norway, uh, there is a concern now that we are seeing that this broad uh, inclusive uh, home ownership is opening up a gap with people who cannot afford to come into the market, the third uh, housing sector. These are people who have uh, uh, good uh, work jobs and uh, a wage, like, um, for instance, the nurses, uh, that cannot afford to come into the market due to the sort of densification policy and the prices being driven up. So even though there is still a support for the ownership line, uh, there is a lot of concern and critique about how uh, one could intervene with the market and where the market fails, uh, both uh, legally and also with various different programs and uh, institutions. Okay, so um, actually what I should have said earlier, but forgot to say that the title of this discussion is actually post-pandemic houses in the Nordic region. Uh, and I know that, uh, that this is something that you have looked into also. Um, so um, from your point of view, what do you think could be the consequences of, of, um, of the pandemic, of, of the COVID? Uh, in the f in the near future or in the longer term on the housing well, market? Hmm. Well, I think there are short and long horizons and we are very much uh, in the middle of it still. Uh, but I think you could safely say that uh, even though Corona doesn't distinguish between people, uh, nevertheless, it does seem to exaggerate and reproduce existing inequality. Uh, so the economic recession uh, has meant uh, an individual economic crisis for many people and also, of course, in business. Uh, but it has also affected the building market and has a more indirect effect of it. Uh, and I think it, it would be interesting to see if the green shift could do something uh, in terms of contribute to adjust the post-market corona. For instance, uh, if uh, issues of redistribution and also quality by innovation could come into the picture. Uh, you could also see that this very steep digital leap that we made could contribute to, for instance, increased participation and, uh, and higher quality. And I think the recognition is that uh, uh, the kind of measures taken to mitigate corona uh, has, been, uh, has taken a, a rather narrow perspective. And there are issues of public health to be considered now, and social, especially in particular to socio-economic groups, like people with a disability, elderly, uh, young people, uh, and so on, uh, that sort of interact with their lesser housing quality and their lesser mobility mm. and uh, interact with isolation, for instance. So there's just as we discussed before the break with the non-functioning housing markets, there are these social gaps that that play in and that are actually um, ex exacerbated by, by, by the pandemic. But you also mentioned the, the green shift. Uh, what link do you see here between, uh, like we talk about, actually the, 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 the phrase often used when we talk about the bouncing back after Corona is to build back better. Of course, that's not just to do with housing, but, but, but what uh, connection do you see between the, the, the green economy or the green shift, as you, as you call it, and, and, uh, and housing in a, in a corona perspective? Well, I don't, see, I don't think we see a link yet, but I certainly think that the emphasis now on shifting and transformation uh, and innovation and also the way the design fields are allowed to uh, affect the method and the approaches to innovation, like for instance in the, in the emphasis on design-driven innovation, I think we could see that developing into something that would affect the housing market in unexpected ways. And it certainly would be a challenge that we would like to put to the private market in, uh, say, in, in the Norwegian context. So uh, maybe on a more 
happy note, uh, I would also like to hear from you because you have actually been um, a member of uh, one of the working groups uh, that uh, are the backbone of this Nordic cooperation program uh, that we are celebrating today. So um, when discussing these things and building back better and, 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 and what can we do about the housing sector, what, what value do you see in Nordic cooperation? Uh, from uh, based on your experience so far as being a part of this this uh, effort actually in w we have been in the machine room so to speak mm. well uh, I'd like to maybe approach that question uh, in a slightly more sort of with a broader perspective because I think that internationalization is not really anything that we can decide if we want to engage in or not we are already very deeply immersed in a multicultural and a globalized society. Uh, and I think that there's two axes which I think is important uh, in terms of the Nordic cooperation. The one is that uh, uh, we can develop Id ideas of uh, how to deal with sustainability in the, from, from the starting point of the Nordic model uh, that I think is less colonizing and less othering to uh, people of, uh, of socio-economic need and also to the way we go about uh, uh, inst uh, unbalanced uh, geographic development. And I think also there is a, um, a Nordic uh, neighbourship strength that we have uh, of trust and uh, equality that we can use as a starting point to take a, a broader role on a global scale. Uh, I mean, the uh, Nordic cooperation has started to look to its neighbors out with, and maybe we can also take an even stronger role globally to uh, share with our resources in uh, development of knowledge and uh, research, uh, testing out things, ways ahead, so that we can take a much stronger role as a driver of transformation on a larger scale than just on the Nordic neighborship uh, mm. uh, yeah. context. That is something I think that has been addressed previously by the Nordic Council Ministers. Various initiatives have, have looked also even uh, uh, on construction and, and, and so on. So, so I think this is interesting feedback uh, also uh, for the politicians and, and to hear that there is actually um, a call for this. But maybe if we also, if we take it back to Norway, um, you were also contributing to this uh, a report that Moa mentioned earlier uh, about uh, affordable housing. Uh, can you expand a little bit on, on, on that from a Norwegian perspective? Well, there are several, uh, there are several things happening now on the Norwegian uh, field. Uh, there is a new uh, housing policy being forward to the government just this autumn, uh, which looks into the, the welfare uh, housing as a, uh, as a a building block of the welfare policy uh, and there are also on a smaller level uh, several um, pilots going on several smaller projects there's also a, a, a proposal to put housing into the um, uh, the first paragraph of the planning law uh, to raise the issues of public housing and to raise the issues of inequality and the welfare connection to uh, policies of housing so there is uh, some movement uh, on the we, we talked about the the planning sector was uh, was so weak in Norway that's one of the things that is mentioned in the report at least so so is there a movement on on that <coughs> or do you think y are, 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 are the planning tools do you get more planning tools well we're hoping that uh, there is a shift towards uh, addressing the uh, shortcomings of the uh, planning Act. Uh, there was an ev evaluation of the Norwegian Planning Act uh, following the, the um, law changes in 2008 to 2009, uh, and some of the um, conclusions of it was that it gives the local authorities, which is the main uh, governmental operational uh, body for housing policy in Norway, that they have very little authority to deal with the kind of holes that the market creates, the third sector, as we call it. Um, and the municipal sector mostly is uh, has to lean on making alliances and make negotiations 
with the private initiated plannings. 80% of Norwegian detour plans are pri privately initiated. Uh, so there is, this is very much in the air still, but there is a movement and there is a consciousness and a critique being raised uh, about these issues. So I think it's, it's a promising horizon, although it's not uh, concrete yet. So things are on the move. That's uh, definitely that's that's positive. Um, I think we shall also be on the move uh, to the to the next speaker, who will uh, join us from Sweden. Thank. So welcome back uh, after this <laughs> short glimpse of Sweden. Um, so uh, we would like to welcome the next speaker now, who is who is um, Anna Granat Hansson from the Royal Institute of Technology. Anna, are you with us? Um. Hey. Hey. Du är redo, nästan. Ja. Ja. Välkommen. Uh, yeah, we pratade you do your lead. That's the wrong language again, Michael. Aye, sorry. <laughs> the minute I see a Swedish person, I start speaking Swedish. <laughs> I don't know what's happening to me. <laughs> but uh, we, when preparing for this, uh, we talked about the fact that we were going to discuss uh, post-COVID um, consequences of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, of in the housing sector and. Uh, you were very excited about actually talking about this, but before we move to that question, I would like you, as as our Swedish representative here, to maybe say a little bit about the the characteristics of the of the housing sector in Sweden. Just a brief overview. Yes, currently the housing shortage is in in focus, like in many other countries, and the policy response up till now has been to just to increase housing production. It, no matter what was built, it was good. But um, what has been seen is that um, um, production has mainly been in the higher market segments, while uh, demand has um, increased considerably in the lower and mid-income ranges. Um, so there seems to be a bit of a mismatch in the uh, policy response. And um, parallel to this, we see historically high um, house prices. Um, and um, um, the state has been very worried, like Moa mentioned, about this and has introduced uh, credit restrictions. Uh, so these two policy responses are sort of contradicting each other, which is an interesting feature. Uh, so uh, up until a year ago, let's say, um, focus was just on building more. But uh, in the recent, the last year, uh, we have seen a lot of discussions around homelessness, overcrowding, housing for immigrants, and, and so on. And the focus has shifted a bit from just building to uh, the existing housing supply and how we can use it more efficiently. Uh, and there are several uh, ongoing government inquiries that are looking into uh, issues that are related to this both on um, more housing for social purposes, but also focusing on the rent system. So it's a question of building more or not building, but using better in a way. Mm. Or both would be good, yes. I think. Uh, when, I, when I think about uh, Swedish housing, I, I, this, this million program, now I'm speaking Swedish again, sorry, but I don't know what you call that, the million house mm. program. The million homes program. Yeah, uh, this is it takes us back to the you, you mentioned that there was like a period from the 60s to the 90s, and then there's a new period from the 90s to now. So, what characterizes these two and 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 the shift between uh, them? Uh, in the 60s, we were in the peak of public um, engagement in the housing sector. Um, we had this program, the Million Homes program, that was supposed to build one million homes in 10 years. Um, and it was built um, very much on um, industrial production. I think all of you uh, recognize this from your own countries. Um, 
large scale uh, housing estates that turned out not with time was part of this program it was not the only one it was about a third of the program uh, and in the end uh, they built a lot of single family housing row housing and so um, or terraced housing in English um, and then uh, in the 90s we had a financial crisis which um, draw ba um, induced a shift in in politics and of course, we also had a political change with the liberal government, uh, and they just they had to cease subsidies to housing. It was a necessity of state budgetary reasons. Um, and then they repealed a lot of uh, regulations and public control of, of production, etc. So some claim we have some one of the most liberal housing markets uh, in Europe today. Yeah, we, we we heard some criticism earlier about this. Uh, uh, certainly, the price level and 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 also that that people simply cannot keep up. But but if we want to look at the 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 COVID angle here, uh, so you have this this historical development. Now you have the housing sector that you have. It could be better, but uh, how do you think it will be affected? And and how will the COVID affect the the planning traditions also? Or the or Will we need to plan differently because of, of the pandemic? We're already discussing how this will affect uh, planning policy. And I think we have very interesting times ahead because in m most of the European countries, we have uh, had a very strong trend toward densification, building re houses really close to each other in uh, large agglomerations. But now, uh, we are seeing that this type of housing is not so attractive anymore. We see the attractiveness of cities uh, decreasing since there are a few restaurants, the cinemas are closed, the theaters are not, not, not making performances anymore and, and so on. So there is a, a double um, force to move out of cities. Uh, it's expensive and it's not as attractive as it used to be. So. Um, we, we are discussing, will this uh, finally mean that we will build lower densities in the cities? And will it mean a revival of single family housing? At least in Sweden, we have seen low production um, relative to multifamily housing of single family housing in um, the last decades. And we think that this could be a, a trend change. So before the break, we were discussing, it was like the... the the trend: the cities are, are drawing all all the the money, and the cities. There's certainly, of course, uh, urbanization taking place, and the rural areas are really challenged. But now you're saying that this could be a, a game changer. It could could really rever help reverse that trend. It could be. It it remains to be seen. Uh, but we have discussed dig digitalization uh, for decades and what that could mean for rural areas and small towns and so on. And now we are proving that it's actually working to work digitally. And perhaps that will uh, um, finally uh, materialize and become a, a true story. And I also think one thing that I think will change uh, quite a lot is the use of the car. Because the trend has been for a very long time that we should have very few or no cars in cities and towns. Uh, but I think that the corona crisis might um, make, uh, mean a push towards, yes, we want the car, but it has to be in a sustainable way. Mm. And to develop the tool rather than uh, abolishing it. So, yeah, the, Tina also mentioned this link between Corona and, and the green transition. So, in a sense, I guess that's what you're addressing here. But another issue we discussed was this, the, the, uh, how will this affect planning in cities? Will we have to build cities differently? Will we need to make more space for people? Uh, will we need to um, create, uh, new build new recreational areas? What, 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 what consequences could we as expect? Um, definitely, you have to um, <laughs> and, um, create completely different towns if this is to be um, viable in the future. Um, you, if you cannot travel um, safely uh, over longer distances, we will return to the 18th century where, where the local community will be more important. 
and all the gains that we have from from um, commuting and so on, it will um, yeah go <laughs> decrease. And I think that would that would be a very sad um, development. But we have to start to think about that. Transportation will be a a big uh, challenge. Mm. You make it sound almost like science fiction. It's uh, like we're, do you <laughs> we change? We're we're facing a whole new world. No, that was not my intention. I didn't want to paint the devil on the on the wall, <laughs> like we say in Swedish. Um, but uh, I think we we should have uh, we have to be creative and think what if. Um, mm. So that's I think uh, definitely a good line. What if? What what can happen? So that's definitely th that's what we're discussing here today. So thank you very much to you, Anna, for for your contribution to this discussion and for joining us. Um, so uh, we will continue the discussion. Thank you to you, Anna. Our next speaker will be from Iceland. Yes, we are back here uh, again after a short glimpse of Iceland. Um, and we will be talking to Elmer Erlensson from the Housing Authority of Iceland. Elmer, are you there? Hi. Yes, yes, you are. Can Hello. You yeah. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. We hear you and we see you. Welcome to uh, this discussion. We were sort of uh, ending up in a sci-fi scenario almost there and I guess Iceland is kind of sci-fi it's it's moon landscapes and everything uh, so maybe you can contribute to this can uh, um, could you say a little bit about the main characteristics of the Icelandic housing market also in light of, of our discussions today yeah well uh, the Icelandic housing market is an, an owner's market uh, where the most people they own their own houses However, there has uh, also been an increased demand for affordable housing for long-time rent for people with, with lower income. So there has uh, been an increased demand for more diverse diversity of, of housing. Um, there's much uncertainty on the market, mainly because of its size, of course, uh, where uh, it's a, a relatively small market in comparison to other Nordic countries. And therefore, we have uh, large fluctuations uh, from where we built new housing. There's new housing being built in accordance with uh, the market's capacity and the demand on uh, any given time to where we almost uh, stop building new houses. And that results, uh, of course, in a, in a gap in the market. So uh, in a certain period uh, where the demand for housing will be much more than the supply and that leads to to rising of the housing prices mm. and that w maybe what we have been experienced uh, over the, the the last years um op over the last three years we have uh, seen also an increase uh, in population and building of new housing in the area surrounding the capital area um, the, the, these areas we have defined as the areas within one hour's uh, distance from a transport time to the capital area. And we have linked this growth uh, to these areas to increased housing prices in the capital area. Mm. So uh, the main focus seems to have been building houses for the, the higher end of, of, of the market uh, or expensive uh, apartments and stuff like that where there has been an increased demand for more affordable housing okay. uh, for m mid range or, or lower income people. Yes. So as we discussed also before the break, this issue of affordable housing is definitely uh, on the agenda. Also, um, uh, speaking of uh, rural housing, you, uh, you were part of the report on rural housing that, that CERN presented before the break. Um, and you did one of the case studies there or you were involved in one of the case studies there. What about, you talk a lot about the capital uh, region, but what about the rural regions? 
Yeah, there has been increased uh, demand for housing all over the country. Um, the increase in tourism has helped a lot all over, uh, where we have had uh, a lot of visitors. So, but the the main thing was that uh, people weren't building houses because of the, the difference between the the cost of building and the market price. So, and uh, uh, the finances companies, uh, institutions often uh, didn't lend out uh, money uh, for financial so we couldn't uh, build up to demand in the, these rural areas so some of the issue we, we discussed definitely uh, is a problem uh, this whole financial gap that that CERN mentioned and so on this is really what you see in Iceland yeah and, and it's, it's maybe it's a disbelief of the market disbelief of the market so there's no trust in the uh, not in the uh, ma many of the uh, rural areas mm. and we also heard uh, from Moa's presentation that that uh, especially in iceland the housing market is a very politicized question uh, speaking of trust and and disbelief and so on um would you say that is correct so, uh, that that the housing market is very politicized. That it is something that that uh, that is, it's a very uh, touchy topic in a way, or something that that engages very different groups of society. For instance, we can we talked about the long-term effects of, of of the of the financial crisis in two thousand and eight. Um, yeah. How how is that felt to today? Well. Uh, uh Mainly, as, a bit, as I discussed before, uh, it's the gap it left in the market uh, where there was some demand, uh, the supply didn't meet the demand. So we're still kind of uh, trying to build to fulfill that uh, demand of housing. Um, so, but of, of course, uh, because of uh, the instability of the market, the financial institutions, like I mentioned before, they retract and they stop financing new projects. Uh, and that's the case we uh, are uh, experiencing now, for example, where we can see that uh, buildings, as we, we, we have discovered, that uh, more uh, less projects are going through on the developing stages mm. so that tells us that in the near future we will have the, the gap like we had in 2008 and after the financial crisis so we have to fulfill that gap so it's not a new bubble it's more like a, it's not more like a plug <laughs> there's no we, flow. we're trying mm, we hope not it's a new not a new bubble we are uh, uh, working on on some some uh, things that we hope that will maintain more stability on the market. Uh, for example, the central bank has lowered interests and that affects the housing market and the, the, the ability of the people to pay off their uh, mortgage and stuff like that. Um, we are al also implementing uh, a new loan category because there has been uh, hard for first time buyers to come into the market for the lower income and mid-range incomes people to buy their own houses. And we are uh, implementing equity loans where the government loans uh, for the equity mm. so okay. they can buy their own houses. So some of that's, we, we discussed that earlier also as some of the options that could help uh, rural housing definitely, that the top up loans and, and guarantees and so on. Finally, before we, we move on uh, to our, our last uh, uh, guest here in this round. Uh, we discussed also the role of tourism and the rental market on, on the housing sector and especially now yeah. we haven't discussed uh, COVID uh, and, the r and the consequences on Iceland but this is actually a place where, where you do feel some consequences because uh, yeah. there are fewer tourism tourists coming. So, so what is the yeah. role of the, the whole the tourism sector on and, and the impact on the housing market? Yeah, well, tourism uh, has perhaps played a big part in, in how we recovered from the financial crisis. Uh, the increase of visitors has been steady over the last years. And uh, that, of course, has led to maybe some apartments were bought to 
by people who uh, especially were to rent them out via Airbnb, for example. Mm. Uh, and that therefore led to that uh, these apartments, they weren't available uh, to buy or rent uh, long term on the domestic market. And in the same time, there was a, a demand for housing. Now, uh, like uh, we don't have as much visitors as we had before due to the COVID pandemic, uh, as you mentioned. We, but we have estimated that these apartments uh, that were bought earlier, they have been placed on the market and uh, some of them, they have been rented out long term. So they are available uh, so as we can see it. Some things are shifting in that. Well, I hope we'll soon have a chance to to come visit in Iceland again. Uh, that's uh, be welcome. That <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you to you, uh, Elmar. Um, we will move on now to uh, our last guest, who is from Sweden, uh, and this is uh, Gunnar. Are you there? I have to say we lost Harry completely, but here we have Gunnar. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you and I can see you. Very good. So, Gunnar, thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, you're a bit of an activist. You're sitting down calmly now, I can see, but uh, you're actually not. Uh, you're actually a very active person and you have made uh, a big difference in your local community. Uh, and this is some of the issues we discussed earlier, you know, what, what difference can you... We talked a lot about financialization and also now we hear from Iceland, the market forces and so on. But uh, but to round up here, uh, it would be great to hear a little from you about what you have actually done um, in your community in Stavsjö uh, and, uh, and, and how you managed to make a difference there. I think you can tell the story better than I can. Well, I'm sort of smiling when you talk about uh, calling us activists. Uh, I thought it was a different expression, but I like it anyway. But I have to give you some background. Uh, we have a small village here, about 400 inhabitants. The background really was that uh, originally the, the grocery store closed down, the uh, school closed down, uh, families with teenagers started to move out, uh, the public transportation thinned out, uh, house prices started to stop or even go down from taking six, uh, two, three weeks two months to sell a house, it could take up to six, nine months to sell a house. So we were on this sort of negative spiral all the way. Basically, the municipality had written off the society or the, the village as a surviving entity. So that's really the, the starting background to uh, why we've been looking at. We need to change this, uh, this situation in one way. And uh, we looked into finding a vehicle that would help us uh, make a change uh, from sort of the uh, people living in, in the village. And uh, there is a fairly new form of, of limited company called uh, li local limited company, or some people use the expression social enterprise. Mm. Public private uh, partnerships. Have, uh, Yes. So today we have about 100 shareholders from two villages, Stauffer is one and a neighboring village is another one. Uh, all those investments, people would have put an investment by maybe a thousand kroner uh, in, into the company. And all those investments, we promised that there would no ever be any dividend being paid out. So why would people want to you know, uh, invest 1,000 kroner in a company with no dividend? Mm. Well. The message which we gave to people was that we want to use this company with some backbone, with its capital, to improve services, whether they are public or private, right? And if you make the company, the, the area more attractive, you can change you know, the, the direction of how people move. And we said that if you move, if you invest, say, a thousand kroner and your, your, your house, you invest a million kroner in a house, just say that we change the price to five five percent. Mm. Upwards, you got a 50 fold payout of your little investment. So, with, with all with, with, with that, we could see or we got a lot of interest, and people realized mm. that we, we can probably do a change if we do it together. So, now, it's, it's help so to self help in a way, very much so. Yeah. And, and the idea was the idea was really to unlock resources in, in the village. 
And what and what has been the result? And and and, and what how how uh, what made uh, you you've also been working with your local municipality? What made them listen to you? Um, well, I initially, uh, what we wanted to have in in here, which we 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 let locked, we let it was the grocery store. If somebody lost the car. In, in, when you're elderly, you couldn't get to the grocery and get any food. A lot of people were waiting to find a, a, a different place to live when sort of the physical impairment of front seat in their life. Uh, they were locked into the area, to the house, couldn't move. There was no place to move. Banks refused to, to give uh, younger people loan. So, so the, 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 the first reaction is to make the, I would call it the reaction, I mean, you go to the community or the municipality and you demand a change or a support. When we started to identify this as our problem, we started to demonstrate what we could do. We told people at the political level that this is what we want to do. And we also demonstrated that we can do it. Mm. We started the first digital grocery store in Sweden. We started one of the first uh, rental apartments, the block of rental apartments, which we finished a year and a half ago. First ones being built in, in the community in municipality in 30 years. We began to demonstrate that we can do it. And of course, it's, it's, a, it's a good course. It's mm -hmm. a conjunction with the, with, 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 the, with the municipality. We have taxpayers moving into the air to the air instead. So once we've been able to demonstrate that, yes, there was a respect. Mm -hmm. Now we have a very positive time. So you had to you prove yourself, and then you improved your your also your your options really. So uh, it sounds like it's a yes we can attitude that you were working from. <laughs> yes, it's it's a can attitude, and it's not you don't you don't want to be a demand machine. You want what you want to do is to demonstrate what you tell and demonstrate what you can do, and what then you go to the municipality and say now we want to collaborate. Mm. We want want to, to reduce the barriers. So this can go on. And obviously, we want other villages and other rural areas to be able to do the same thing. And we want the municipality to be cooperating in that sense. Yes. Uh, I will have to uh, call, uh, move on now. But thank you so much for these observations. And actually, um, I think that a lot of people, or I hope some, a lot of our uh, participants would like to discuss this with you further on in, in this mingle that we will be doing uh, at 3:30 uh, after the event, so I think uh, you will get a chance to to talk more about your experiences. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for this so far, uh, and we will move on to the last speaker. But thank you to you, Gunnar. And uh, to round off today, uh, on a yes we can note, uh, we have the director of Norregio, Shell Nilsson. Um, who will talk, of course, uh, yeah, give us some some uh, feedback on uh, his take on the discussions today, but also look a bit forward to, to what is coming up, both on uh, not Regio, but uh, the n regional sector in the Nordic countries as such. Uh, Shell, are you there with us? Yes. yes. Uh, Hello, uh, Shell. Hello. <laughs> A general reflection uh, when it comes to the the program today is actually that uh, the housing market today is a consequence of uh, a longer political trend of a liberalization. And uh, when we have a long trend of liberalization and uh, the market forces rule then, of course, there are some consequences of this. And uh, uh, one of the most important negative consequences of uh, uh, a very liberalized uh, housing market is uh, that we get uh, uh, segregation in different ways. Mm -hmm. Segregation between geographical areas and segregation within especially the cities. And uh, this is, of course, recognized as an uh, important uh, political uh, problem by all governments in our Nordic countries. And then uh, 
what can you do about it? Yes, uh, the both reports that uh, has been referred to here uh, by the, the keynote presentations, they um, list a lot of different uh, options that are used by the, the Nordic governments today, mm. actually. And uh, as I see it, I mean, uh, what is normally the case is that uh, uh, it's not a quick fix to, to, so to say, to make it more easily for uh, vulnerable groups to come into the, the, the uh, housing market, for example. But it's a combination of different efforts. And there I think that uh, uh, the Nordic cooperation can, uh, can be uh, quite efficient, actually, in uh, showing uh, a, a, a kind of a a smorgasbord of different options. And mm -hmm. then uh, also we are trying to to, uh, to evaluate some of the effects of different of these different options. Well, it's good to hear and that uh, the work of Nordregio uh, is used uh, by the governments, first of all. But but uh, could you maybe elaborate on, on the work ahead then, uh, some of these options that you yeah, mentioned? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, but first, I, I just like to comment uh, that uh, I also voted in this uh, different measures, and I think that one example of a state intervention that I think is uh, is very good is this uh, with the top loans that you can get uh, eighty percent of the construction cost in in Iceland, for example. Then it was somewhat surprising, as you also mentioned, that maybe then you looked at uh, the other Menti question, uh, which was most, most efficient. It was actually the local initiatives that were lifted in front. And I think, of course, the municipalities and local groups like uh, uh, Gunnar uh, Kassestad's uh, example, the last one, uh, the ability to help yourself, Mm. with bottom-up initiatives is a good complement. But I think that we will see further uh, actions from uh, the governments, actually, to, to avoid some of the negative consequences. So we need structural then you, changes. Uh, yeah, uh, in some cases, yes. Mm. And that will probably come uh, sooner or later. Uh, Next steps, uh, what's happening, two things have mm. been mentioned here uh, already. Uh, of course, when I say that a negative consequence of, uh, uh, so to say, a uh, uh, problem on, with the housing market is that, uh, uh, that uh, the problem of segregation. And in that case, the, the next, uh, session of Norwegian Forum is actually dealing with mm. uh, efforts to uh, to fight segregation in our cities. Yeah. Uh, so that is one. And the other, uh, uh, unfortunately, Harry Flam uh, was not able to participate here in the afternoon. Uh, but uh, uh, he, it was mentioned that uh, he's chief editor of Nordic Economic Policy Review. Mm -hmm. And there, uh, the different chapters in that issue, which will come next year, will uh, focus on uh, different uh, economic effect of different housing policies mm -hmm. or, or, economic, uh, or economic measures re uh, regulating uh, the housing market. Mm -hmm. Uh, when it comes to the further research job and, and the development within the, the uh, uh, Nordic Council of Ministers, then in the new cooperation program for regional development and planning, uh, there is definitely a clear focus, especially actually on the housing problems in the cities and a little more focused on uh, uh, deprived areas or mm. problem areas and the effects of different matters on how to deal uh, with them. So that is, uh, there is one of the focus areas that the thematic group on green and inclusive urban development 
will focus on. So as you mentioned, yes. that will that will actually will come up in the next Norregio Forum when we have to round up uh, off this one. Uh, but um, uh, on the 18th of November, there will be a new Norregio Forum uh, in the same format as this one, and it will deal with inclusive housing. Uh, so uh, cities. inclusive cities sorry yes but <laughs> there is a bridge from today's event uh, yeah. so thank you very much for following us today and stay uh, stay with us a little longer uh, because uh, Johanna you will uh, now introduce uh, thank you also Shell and thank you to all the speakers who participated today and who will still stay on I don't know if we will get Harry in one of the mingle rooms but um, at least uh, all the other speakers will be there so Johanna, please, uh, could you uh, guide people? Yes, so when you received the link today, you also received links to different meeting rooms where you can talk to the speakers directly. And since we lost Harry along the way, we have reorganized a bit. So in room one, you can talk to Egon and Tina and Elmar. And then in room two, we have Moa and Anna. And in room three, Søren and Gunnar. So please join them for a bit and ask the questions that were not addressed during mm. this session and meet others that are interested in the same issues as you are. And yeah, maybe thank you very Maybe much. you should take the groups again, Johanna, I think. Yes, okay. So in room one, there you will be able to talk to Egon, Sina, sorry, Egon, Tina and Elmar. And in room two, Moa and Anna, and in room three, Søren and Gunnar. So only three rooms. The fourth room will not be opened. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for everyone following today. Thank you for sending us your questions and for participating. Thank you to the speakers. And stay tuned and join in for the next Nordregio Forum on the 18th of November. Thank you. Thank you.